I want to start with a, a kind of a concept that um, is kind of weird to people, but we need a new peace movement. And I say that because, as if you probably most of us know, the anti-war movement has um, had some difficulties the past few years. And if I can, indul if you indulge me on this, I'm going to actually engage in some um, Obama bashing a little bit. That's well, I, I, and I want to be very serious about this. This isn't like to play to the crowd. I mean, Barack Obama needs to be very seriously held accountable to what he's done to the anti-war movement, as well as the people who participated and allowed this to happen. Um, the question I'm often asked is, what happened to the anti-war movement? And the sad thing is, is that the neoconservatives and the nationalists were right. It wasn't um, a legitimate anti-war movement for the most part. It was moderate liberals who had a very, very strong tie. I mean, they, they had a very strong, such a strong tie to partisanship that, well, it's a George Bush war, so it's got to be wrong. And real serious issues of ethics, you know, like mass murder, for example, just didn't play into that. And 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 when the Bush years were over. Quietly, everyone walked away. And there's empirical evidence for this, too. This isn't anecdotal. I mean, a, a political scientist who's a liberal and a Christian and, and was a Barack Obama supporter and been a very serious anti-war activist spent a lot of time studying this and saw what happened. And we see things like, you know, partisanship in this country being so strong, like it's almost a church. It's a religious belief. It's a being a Democrat for some people is as important as being a Catholic or a Jew, which to me seems like rather peculiar from, you know, from my particular perspective. And they were so they so identified personally with Barack Obama that it just didn't matter that his anti-war credentials not only were non-existent, but were mostly the product of hype and public relations. And all of that was very obvious. There's nothing hidden there. Barack Obama made one speech in 2007 on Iraq, and that was it. And public relations after that, and his ability to, and his, the people around him, his ability to really spin or make delicate implications were there that allowed enough liberals to convince themselves that I guess it's perfectly okay to vote for someone who promised that he would go into Afghanistan to kill more people, because that's the good war is what Barack Obama said. And I just want to think about that to sink in for a second. Barack Obama said that's a good war. Obama went further than that, though. He said he wanted to expand the war into Pakistan, which, of course, is an allied country, which should have a lot of us like doing one of these numbers, like what? And what he wanted to expand, and what he has expanded, and what has empirically proven, you can actually look at the metrics, he has ordered more drone strikes now at this point than George Bush ever did and now is more responsible for more deaths. And what a drone is is essentially a robot that rips bodies apart. And that's what Barack Obama thinks is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And the people who voted for him, who once marched in the streets against George Bush, are supporting very loyally a man who thinks it's okay to send robots to kill civilians. And that just, to me, that's so damning, and that people need to be confronted and called out about that. But I'm not sure that's effective in bringing together the, the new peace movement. And it may be good for us entirely to get rid of the old anti-war movement, because for the past 10 years, groups like ANSWER, however well-meaning they are, have created a carnival-like atmosphere around the anti-war movement. They call events they, around Afghanistan times of the anniversaries, and when you go to an event, it's everything but discussing Afghanistan and Iraq. It's free mamiya, it's gay marriage, it's socialized medicine, and whatever you think about those things, they have nothing to do with Afghanistan or Iraq. And that does not serve us particularly well when we needed a serious, sober anti-war movement that was unified, that was consistent, that was maybe nonpartisan and even non-ideological, one that might have been open to more people. Because after all, an anti-war movement that's only based on people who are comfortable with the hard left is going to be a very small anti-war movement, and not one that is going to create mass action. So after we kind of took responsibility as an anti-war movement and looked at ourselves really honestly, some of us thought that there, there needs to be something else. And there has been things in the past. Historically, there have been things like the Anti-Imperialist League, and certainly the old right in this country has a long tradition. People euphemistically call it isolationism, but what they really mean is a republic, not an empire. And that's something that's a basic American value, a republic, not an empire. 
So what, what can be done that's practical? And I want to give people practical steps. And one of the things that came together, and I'm going to show you this book here, it's called Come Home America. It's a website, a concept, and a compilation of essays from people from all over the political spectrum and people whose names you'd recognize from Bill Kaufman to Cindy Sheehan to people who worked on, the, on Pat Buchanan's campaign to our own Justin Raimondo. The people from all over are talking about the really the peaceful, patriotic tradition of not involving ourselves in the affairs of others. And that's a very simple tradition. It comes from the founding fathers. And it's also, and maybe I'm being quaint and naive, but it's also what's constitutional. And maybe the constitution isn't terribly important or relevant anymore. Maybe we are changing, but that's still technically what we swear to be the law of the land. And that's still part of the, when I talk about American exceptionalism, which is different than I think what Rick Santorum or anyone else thinks, I'm thinking of things like the Bill of Rights, like that something, that the Bill of Rights, something that's really special, that re recognizes that there are basic human rights, like a right to free speech, or the right to bear art, to protect oneself, that we just ta talked about with Mr. Pratt's discussion, very, very basic rights that all we all have, that are universal and timeless, and that aren't broached by the fact that there's a Democrat in the White House, or a Republican, or whomever. And those are the issues that, and it's that spirit in which Come Home America really works. When I say, I mean, pro-peace, and I say the new peace movement, because we're working towards something, not just against something. Peace is patriotic, and it's also, it's prosperity. Most people in here are probably familiar with some of the economic ideas that Ron Paul talks about, and particularly the ideas that come out of uh, the Mises Institute and the Austrian economic theory. And it's, these are all, and it, you don't have to be an economist to really understand these things that, Wartime economies are an oxymoron. There's no such thing. I mean, wars don't create real markets. They just destroy things. Death and destruction. I mean, if war were actually good for the economy, why don't we just burn, up, burn down Wichita and then just rebuild it and see what happens as, like that, as if that's creating wealth? So what, what we've done at Come Home America is that we're transpartisan. We're open to any, everyone who believes, you know, basically that regular people can be against war and empire. And that it's sound, it's good for America, and it's what's good for each of us in terms of things like protecting our Bill of Rights, national security, it makes us safer. And I think Dr. Paul has done an excellent job in introducing us to basic concepts like how, why do we have terrorist attacks? They don't just come from the sky randomly. I mean, there's reasons why we have these things. And there are wonderful ways of explaining these ideas to people that don't involve a lot of jargon, that don't involve stridency. Um, I mean, I love, I, I come from, a, I'm a second generation libertarian, I come from an anarchist tradition, so I'm used to saying things like occupation and baby killers, and that may make me feel good, but that's not selling people the idea of peace, and it's not bringing in people who might not feel comfortable. And I, it's interesting, because a lot of my life uh, I've spent uh, dealing with issues, uh, you know, fighting against racism, sexism, and homophobia. But there's been a flip in my life because for the anti-war move, the new peace movement to be effective, it needs to be welcoming to Christians, to people really of all faith, to people from middle America, normal people who aren't activists, people who have real families. It needs to be open to white men. It needs to be open to ordinary people who have been completely isolated and shut out by the anti-war movement such as it's been since 9-11. And that's what's going to create the mass action and the mass movement. And one of the things that's miraculous about Ron Paul, and it's, it's the right thing that it's coming from a white Christian man with four children from Texas who's speaking to the GOP audience. He's speaking directly to people who don't believe that Arabs are human beings or don't believe that foreigners have rights. He's talking directly to the people who need to have their minds changed. And that's very courageous of him. And I think that's a model that we all should follow is that we shouldn't just talk amongst ourselves. I mean, you know, I can go to a Libertarian Party meeting and sure, everyone's going to nod, oh, Angela, that's great. Oh, you're so right. But that's not taking the next step in changing minds. And for a lot of us, and we have an amazing opportunity right here this weekend where there's people from different parts of the right. And I've had some wonderful conversations this weekend on people who they like Dr. Paul a great deal, but they're not sure about his foreign policy. And... This is the opportunity to change people's minds, literally one at a time. And that's how we're going to get a new peace movement. But um, how, do we, how do we go out and really reach out to the rest of the world that is not really familiar with these ideas? And one thing we need to talk about is 
not only is it dangerous to the Bill of Rights and to our national security, but war is anti-family. You cannot be pro-family and pro-life and be pro-war. It's utterly incompatible, and the stats show it. The suicide rates among veterans and active military are embarrassing. I mean, they're a national shame, and they're not hidden. I mean, the military publishes them, and others have published studies on them. The divorce rates are astronomical because it's not normal for families to be separated. And is it normal for any... I mean, is it? Is it? do we really want a world in which we celebrate. We see this all the time, like on CNN, where they'll reunite a military family where there's a new infant. And I'm thinking, is that really something that's a wonderful thing, that fathers are separated from their baby daughters for a year and a half at a time, or they miss the birth of their own child? How is that pro-family? It's even a little worse than that, I imagine. And, and it's not my, my place to ask this question, but I imagine there's many people in here, you all have different positions on abortion, but for those who are pro-life, being pro-life and pro-war cannot work, and it, not just in a moral and ethical sense, but it literally doesn't work. In Iraq, the depleted uranium and what we've left chemically behind causes terrible deformities to fetuses and causes spontaneous abortions. And that's something that we should be ashamed of as a country that claims to value life, especially innocent child life. I mean, what did an Iraqi fetus do to you that's so terrible that it's okay for that child to be you know, because of terrible chemicals and environmental problems to be spontaneously aborted. I mean, there's no, there's no point to that.